generally day to nature transaction can take time it's a good deal for sri lanka whether we should do pre or post is the question now we have to definitely do it because government will save hundreds of millions of dollars by going into day to nature or day to esg structure uh, opportunity is there banks are lining up i think the dfis are lining up i think we have to grab that you know biodiversity there's enough of opportunity we have over 100 corporates that that have come forward what we don't have is right now projects they are ready to fund they are, you know it's not not for a tangible return right now they get the return is intangible right but we have results to show look here your five years investment is this is funding is there but projects are not there you have donors who have taken on some sunk capital to put into this project but then the reason it's good risk is because it's a market driven experience so we are creating a product which ties into demand for a product like this globally and so the trail may be the reason you come to sri lanka rather than you come to sri lanka and then do the trail and what that brings is that it aligns the businesses with the market the audience the visitor who is looking for a uh, sustainable lower footprint more ecological uh, immersive experience Sri Lanka has an opportunity to chart a new growth path out of this economic crisis one that puts nature uh, at the heart of that economic recovery focusing on natural capital and nature positive economic activity and business models now a key part of that will be to get capital to move in the right direction financial capital to recognize the value of natural capital and today's session which is part of a series that the center for a smart future is doing with echelon uh, focuses on that finance aspect and capital we have a wonderful panel of uh, folks from different parts of that finance and capital ecosystem and we are going to focus on what is the role of finance in helping sri lanka's economic recovery put nature at the heart of it we have with us uh, binguma who is the uh, ceo of standard chartered bank also the deputy chair at the ceylon chamber of commerce and the president of the sri lanka banks association very well respected uh, bank and now using those platforms to kind of influence this new trajectory we are talking about we have uh, Errol Aberatna who is a former banker veteran banker now uh, the green finance specialist at the EU Switch Asia project called Plastics which is about circular economy business models being supported by green finance and we have Shehan Shehan Ramanayake who uh, has held many different roles ranging from finance tourism in government uh, now uh, a key force in the Pico Trail which is this groundbreaking new a trail that really measures uh, livelihoods businesses uh, the tourism industry plantation companies um and um i think shehan will bring a nice mix of those different perspectives he's had also on the committee of uh, environmental organization i'm going to dive right in by just taking a moment for all of us to to get a sense of where the current landscape for green financing uh, is and what do stakeholders really understand what this space is about and what the potential is so maybe i'll ask the banker in the room pingoma to go first um what is the current landscape for for green finance yeah anush first of all thanks for having me in the show um see um, i believe sri lanka had green finance or sustainable finance uh for some time now because of the buyers were demanding uh, these type of manufacturing especially in the apparel sector so apparel sector probably started uh, green or sustainable finance long time ago uh, banks kind of rallied we didn't have a framework at the time this is like 10 15 years ago we were doing stuff then i think the solar came in then the green taxonomy of central bank in 2022 interestingly sri lanka banks association slba had a green finance uh, a sustainable finance initiative starting uh, in 2014 and then chambers such as ceylon chamber at the climate action uh, steering committee in 2022 um so i think work has started somewhere but sadly what happened was during covid we kind of the whole world got distracted the funding went into more on the health sector elevating poverty moved away a little bit from the climate action the globally we saw that happening we also saw you know funds moving to the west because the interest rates rates went up in the us we saw that as well but overall i think uh, sri lanka had done a lot of work Uh, in terms of activating the system 
Uh, I think uh, now what is important is we also have to acknowledge that we are still crossing that restructuring. So in terms of getting funding, uh, it's a bit tricky right now. Uh, I think what is important is to understand the roadmap in this new world order. You know, what, is, what are the low hanging fruits? What is there for the medium term? What is there for the long term? I think the banks are ready. I think the DFIs are ready. Um, policy holders, policy makers definitely understand what needs to be done. Uh, we just need to tighten certain areas and, you know, uh, take it forward. I, I believe there's a huge opportunity because Stan Chart did a research with, uh, with 300 funds. This was pre-pandemic, just like uh, 300 funds valued at $50 trillion. We, we call it the $50 trillion question. We asked these investors, what is your appetite? What do you want to do in the next five to 10 years? In that there was a specific question of Sri Lanka. And they said that we have an investment appetite of 16 to 18 billion dollars running up to 2030 uh, uh, into Sri Lanka for sustainable finance. Of course, there's a larger part of that is green. So that's the size of the opportunity for Sri Lanka. Of course, after the pandemic, things have changed a little bit. Uh, we need more private sector participation in the emerging markets, no doubt about it. Uh, certain things should be led by the public sector because you know public sector will have to take on battles like the low you know uh, revenue or low income segments sadly private sector will get into an area where the returns are lucrative uh, but i th i think we have to take things forward now in this new world Errol, uh, just to move on to you so bingumal talked about that this opportunities is now there there have actually been initiatives like the sustainable banking initiative, the green taxonomy. So some of these things have been happening, but you regularly speak to actual the lending folks in banks. You also speak to businesses, SMEs who are seeking uh, finance. So in your experience, what does that environment currently look like? Is it is the readiness there? What are some of the you know real practical aspects of that green financing environment that you're seeing right now? Yeah. Once again, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I agree with Bingo what he said. Actually, although the concept is new, sounds new, you know, banks started 10 years ago, a decade ago, the work was uh, work began basically. basically. Uh, right now, uh, everybody's talking about funding aspect only. It's about uh, bonds. Always we talk about green bonds, that we are not in a position to go for the bonds because of the debt restructuring and other issues uh, related. But the thing is, there are things uh, that you can do in the short term and the medium term, like uh, you mentioned, basically, because the taxonomy is there for uh, guidance. Then we have the stock exchange has done uh, their work, uh, putting up the uh, framework for the listing of the bonds. Then recently, cabinet approved the framework for green bonds. So those are in the long term, you can use those things. But in the short term, when I talk to the banks, what they found is that public is not aware of this concept, really. It has not gone into the public why they should participate. Without the public participation, the banks will not be able to generate the required resources, basically. There's a mismatch. When we talk about green finance, we are talking of, you know, it's a long-term payoff, it's a long-term uh, investment. But the most of the uh, investments in the bank, resources are short-term. So public awareness is very important. And if the concept is taken to the public, why? Question is, why green finance? What is it about? Ultimate goal is we are trying to tackle the climate change to make sure that there will be zero emission, right? And the temperature will be controlled below 1.5. So those, those are the basic goals. So green financing is about that. So whether you're financing the green or greening the finances, you know, people talk about. So market is ready basically, right? As you said, the policy level, all things are in place, but we need to get the public involved. So public awareness is very important why we go for it. So into short term and long term, medium term, my investigation that will money is available. It's a matter of bank reaching out to these people, philanthropists, there are funds available, but they need to know why. If they know the reason, there'll be good results. So that's an interesting point because what you're saying is that it's uh, not only about the funds overseas, but domestically oh, yeah. the opportunity to mobilize yes. money. Yes, right? yes, um, yes. When you say, Awareness, do you think that the products are ready for, I mean, let's say there's greater public awareness about why they need to uh, put money towards this. How, how would that practically work? You, yeah. you know, you've been thinking about this a little yeah. bit. First thing is uh, public needs to know the why is green financing? Why do you call it green? From where did it uh, start? For what purpose? Public need to get to know about the climate change. It's all about waste management. It's all about pollution. 
control. It's all about, you know, greening the economy. President talks about greening the economy. So you find that all levels, you know, people are talking about. But the general public do not know. Now I'll give you a good example. I'm now I'm representing biodiversity, basically. We have gone into uh, corporates involved. Initially, five years back, there was not much of a, a, a response when you ask them to participate in the project. Every corporate had CSR projects. But today, we have 30 acres of land reforestation in uh, southern province. Cargills, uh, CDB, uh, NTB, uh, Commercial Bank, they have come forward. Private capital is coming forward. Why? It's not for a return because they know there's a you know, long term there's a return because it's, it has to be done. If the climate change affects, if we don't take control of now, everybody's going to suffer. So the money is there. We didn't expect the money to come in. Money came. Now they first initially signed for five years. Now they have signed for the next five years also. So if the pr products are there, for example, say deposits, if you're talking about now, just naming a deposit, green deposit, you won't get money. Just saying green, people will ask, what is it? So it ha you have to issue, you have to have those deposits at a uh, concession rate. You, you can't go at the market rates. So if the public is aware why they should go below 2% or 3% in the long term, it, you know, they are contributing to the economy. Long term, they are contributing to the uh, safeguarding of the planet. You know, the money will come in. So then the bank will have lesser cost and they will be able to finance long term projects. Even, you know, we are talking of renewable energy, things like that. The money will be there. That's my. Yeah, I, I think I want to come back to some of those because Errol, you brought up very valid points about the public. If they are to say accept 200, 300 basis points less for a deposit and if it's tagged as green, what does that really mean and that pipeline and the credibility? So I'll come back to that. But Shehan, we seem to be slightly trying to diversify the conversation away from just lending or low, you know, debt uh, or the banking sector. If you had to zoom out and look at more broadly the role of private capital, other funding sources beyond public, you know, tax uh, money, fiscal transfers to try and get capital to move in the direction we want to support nature positive um, economic activity. What does that landscape look like? Is there readiness? Is there interest? Or, you know, what are you seeing with stakeholders you speak to? Uh, it's a great question. First, uh, thanks for having me and uh, great to be part of an esteemed panel. Um, I think, as you say, when you zoom out, um, you want to see, okay, what are we trying to do? There is a, a path that we as a planet and in several economies combined and private sector and all people are moving on, which we deem is not sustainable, which is why we're having this conversation today. And so um, in that trajectory, how do we alter it to be more sustainable or even regenerative eventually um, and be very nature positive and have biodiversity uh, at the core of it? And so with change comes risk. And so who is playing in that pool of risk and how do we manage that risk in order to align the players for there to be a good sound risk return profile in the greening, either on the, uh, the lovely quote, are you greening the finance or financing the green? I think that that's a great yin yang for, for this conversation. But in that yin yang, I think you have a risk uh, conversation to look at. The short answer to your question is opportunity is very strong because we have great biodiversity and nature assets in Sri Lanka. And I think there is certain uh, obstacles that we can uh, overcome and adjust to make the transition to a greener economy um, faster uh, and more uh, productive for the stakeholders involved. Um, and I think that might come uh, with certain mobilizers. So money definitely is a mobilizer, whether it's debt or whether it's investment, whether it's uh, equity uh, tapping into a certain pool of funds or pools of funds like uh, Bingumal mentioned, who have an appetite for this kind of investment uh, on that green risk adjusted return expectation whether it's local or international. And I think international is quite strong. And then you have other mobilizers that we can get into into this conversation, like uh, how do we actually 
audit whether something is sustainable, green, etc. And the tourism industry, for example, globally does have accredited partners who can look at your footprint uh, as a hospitality service provider that's tied into GSTC, which is the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. So then they can say, OK, you know, what is your rating? How much water are you using? How much electricity are you using per room night, etc.? You know, depending on the sector and the industry, there are certain channels that you can use to align between a risk return appetite of funds an investment opportunity, mobilizers on the ground, and then eventually you want to measure that impact because that's what it all comes back to the investor. The investor wants to say, I put money here, but how can I verify that this money, that if I'm sacrificing any return at, for, for, for a dirty investment, how do I know that this clean, green, regenerative investment actually did what it's supposed to do? Yeah. So I think, Pingwan, I, I, I want to move now to, to that. I was planning on bringing it later, but this is uh, uh, coming as quite an important point. Out of my own interest, I rang up banks that offer various products and, and you know, try to ask some questions around where does the money go? Let's say they have a, a new brand positioning that involves green. I want to know more. If they have a deposit that had the word green, I want to know more. And I was a little disappointed because I think the, their heart is in the right place. But in terms of being able to tell the customer what really is going on here? How really are we verifying? How really are we ensuring there's credibility? Perhaps in your view as you know, the chair of SLBA, uh, what more must we do? Or what, you know, what's, what is the next stage we have to get to in terms of that rigor, the credibility, the discipline? Because this could quite easily risk going down a very you know, um, unrealistic greenwashing kind of route where both the borrower and the the the, cust the depositor can quickly lose faith. So, uh, you know, where are we on that right now? And what more can we do to bring that confidence? I'm sure what I can tell you is the work is definitely happening. It's sad sometimes when you call some of these frontline staff, some, sometimes they don't know the real underlying cause and what we do with the money, how the monitoring happens, all of that. So sadly, the communication has a huge gap, I would say. This is not only in Sri Lanka. Across the world, we see these problems in a lot of the sectors for that matter, including the banking sector. I think the most important piece is the MIS. Again, the MIS is a global challenge. Uh, we see MIS being you know, a challenge in many, even some of the developed markets. Uh, and the monitoring piece, you know, in a lot of the banks, generally, if you take standard chartered, we have a green finance committee. So every deal would go to that committee. It wouldn't happen locally. It'll go to a center and you have expertise from different organizations sitting there approving these transactions as green. Because the challenge is we are moving a hell of a lot of brown into green these days. As an industry, it's very common. So you have to be very careful in terms of moving these assets into green and have you ticked all the boxes is one question. Second biggest thing we see is we are also retagging transactions as green. You've been doing green without knowing it's green. So now you want to retag it as green and get some benefit, right? So that's also very common. It's not a bad thing to do. First of all, you had to assess your existing portfolio. So everybody's doing that. So in that process, the governance framework around it, the MIS, I'm sure every bank has something, but to what level I cannot commit my uh, comment at this point, but I'm sure every bank has a green finance committee or maybe in their credit committees, they have a green finance vertical where they certify these things. There are on some of the cases, you get the external agencies to come and support, certify. Then only we get the funding from DFI. So there are ways of managing those. Some work is happening. I don't think any player would call something green and then you do something and just optimize. It's just that the communication can definitely improve. Uh, but SLBA is constantly driving the messaging. We even have e-learning platform for all our bankers now. Uh, we paid an agency, we got an e-learning platform. It's been there for a while, actually, we're trying to reactivate it again. Uh, so a lot of work happening in terms of enhancing awareness, you know, uh, making sure people know what they're doing and making sure that we don't lead to greenwashing as an industry. Do you feel that there's interest among banks to partner with external stakeholders? It may not be, you know, the highest international certification body because your part of the credit line was that you have to get audited but locally nationally do you feel that there is interest among financial institutions to partner with local say conservation organizations environmental advisory groups to to see how they can improve their 
the credibility of the product or the monitoring is is are we there yet or yes and no i would say some of these large transactions and portfolios are driven by dfis so they would always say get an external party so you're driven by those guidelines so you get somebody to sign off on some low hanging fruits maybe the banks will decide to go on their own because they have a governance structure they have a credit committee the audit committee so they also have expertise some of these banks have built expertise over the years i, I don't say they are not open for that idea but they would not just go and sign up with somebody for the sake of signing up they'd be very careful they'll be pretty much driven by driven by the funding agencies and they will generally certify uh, so for the local organization it'll be critical to align to the global organizations and have those standards in place so you then can also come up and say hey why don't you sign up with me because the cost will be much lower you're on the ground you know what's going on errol because of your recently or maybe i'm not sure how how recently you you were a you were a banker you were you know in on the lending side talk with corporates so thinking of yourself as in that role and your colleagues in the banking sector um do you feel that there are there's an appreciation for an understanding of how to assess projects credit proposals that involve and en- sensitive environmental issues maybe so it is the not doing any harm side but also new opportunities that may have new credit proposals that may be more on the nature positive side nature gain side um could you talk a little bit about that thinking back in your role and your colleagues what what is the level of literacy around yeah, green it's, it's lending it's a good question still i find you know with all the new concepts in the market we talking about traditional banking is what is taking place basically easy lending take collateral that kind of thing we talk about this new concept of resource uh, efficiency clean production concept you know i think the bankers need capacity building on that especially the lending staff how to get the business uh, say manufacturing environment to get uh, to transit into a uh, new dimension on resource uh, efficiency because we are talking of greening the idea is uh, not to give more money that will contribute to pollution that will contribute to you know cl- climate problems you know so there there is resource efficiency is not a area even myself as a, you know lending officer we were not thought to look into that there i mean if you take up the manual it's there in theory that you need to look into these things but when you really go to lending you know customer wants to buy a machine say for example they want to buy a machinery we look at the invoice pricing all that and we don't go into the technical side of it uh, and unlike what dfcc and ndb had done in the good old days when they were when they did the development banking so this area i find that there's uh, room for capacity building lending officers need to be trained on resource efficiency uh, uh, part of it you know be, uh, uh, in credit appraisal uh, that assessment if that assessment is done properly on resource uh, efficiency there are a lot of opportunities a lot of opportunities because clients do not know for example now a couple of uh, engagements that i had people are just going by and buying machines but actually there are better machines with the less uh, using less uh, fossil fuel you know less emission all that even the clients are not aware of that that's a area the bankers also should step in you know of course first they need to build up their capacity they need to acquire that knowledge and they need to transit to the customers basically you know so that's a area the bankers have to get into it so because otherwise as you first mentioned about this green washing we are all the time talking about renewable energy putting up uh, solar panels and ev only say for example even if you fund the renewable energy uh, sector with solar panels and if they are contributing to the pollution and the factory is using more fossil fuel or even if you finance evs for example vehicles where are they charging again from the national grid you know so the purpose is not uh, met so i feel the bankers my colleagues i always talk to them when i ask them do you know why we need to do this but about this uh, green in the economy part they are forgive me if i am wrong but uh, you know this is my what i have gathered they are not privy to the uh, uh, for example sdgs you know by 2030 what we are supposed to do by 2050 what is the paris accord is uh, expecting to uh, achieve globally and nationally so these on these areas the capacity building has to take place and that will make a big difference to the bank building up the por- portfolio uh, i believe even the uh, uh, not only lending portfolio i'm talking of deposit portfolios even because there are opportunities there's a lot of money that is not coming into the banking stream there are a lot 
lot of money in various other investments people are doing so capacity building is something that i will uh, uh, emphasize that is required for the bankers right now so one aspect uh, shehan is the capacity building getting credit officers getting banks to think differently at how they appraise but ultimately many of these come down to risk and come da- comes down to more traditional vanilla you know issues around collateral now if that's true of our you know regular economic activity brown economic activity it becomes perhaps even more enhanced or more problematic when we are talking about nature positive economic activity natural capital which is less well understood natural asset are less well understood valuations uh, don't exist so do you have any thoughts around how to crack that piece are there other actors that we could bring in to kind of take on that piece or are we saying that you know we just need the banks to 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 think differently well well it's exactly that question that has given rise to what we now know as blended finance in in international capital markets and blended finance isn't uh you know uh, an easy win to just execute i think there's uh, both great successes as well as pitfalls in the evolution of blended finance globally but what you have is an interesting concept where you know you have some amount of risk capital either usually a donor or a dfi as you mentioned takes some risk and mobilizes a greater pool of private capital which is a simple very simple definition of blended finance and so you're allowing private capital to move into areas that you know we are talking about but with some risk assurance and management by having a dfi take some of that so that can come I mean, there's many ways to structure it it can look quite exotic or it can be simple as like a first loss guarantee of a bond or or a loan i think there's a role there for people who want to put capital at risk in order to mobilize a greater pool of money and donors um you know and dfis would be great starting points for that because with a little bit of money they're able to uh, leverage or mobilize a larger pool of capital that finds its way to worthwhile uh, outcomes right talking about that uh, leveraging other types of capital into this new space one uh, and also blended finance one uh, type of instrument being one that we're seeing that happen where it's multiple different parties uh, coming together is at the sovereign level right sovereign funding instruments linked to nature depending on who you talk to in sri lanka you get different responses to whether we are ready and you know how important this is you speak to government folks very excited because it's seen as that new source of capital we can quickly tap into the moment the debt restructuring or even before that as some feel uh moment that's concluded you talk to bankers like yourselves perhaps you're a also op- optimistic you know it's there but i'd like to hear your view you certainly talk to the conservation community the environmental community there is deep concern some of it stemming from a lack of understanding but also concerns around how there have been mishaps in some countries even while there have been good examples where do you think we are at right now sri lanka as an economy as a group of stakeholders in going towards the sovereign instruments sovereign debt instruments linked to nature green bonds blue bonds debt for nature swaps debt for climate swaps we hear about it a lot but what is your view on our readiness or do we really understand the nuances of going down that road? specifically about debt to nature i would like to start by saying it's real uh, blue and green at this point because our rating is not great i would like to keep that aside though the framework is ready for for green bonds uh, because the investors will look at you know the the sovereign rating uh, because there's a massive capital that they had to allocate when you do those investments debt to nature had been a i mean i wouldn't say common but a tool that a lot of the countries have used when they're in debt and they're in stress so jamaica had done it recently ecuador did a deal as a latest deal 1.6 billion dollars ecuador uh, managed to carve out part of their debt and protect an area in galapagos mm-hmm. generally what happens is basically you take part of your debt and you get funding to buy back the bonds so depending on the price points you you buy back the bonds and there is a saving at that point and you also in this funding comes for like 30 years funding at low interest rate so overall from the uh, kind of haircut you take because you're buying things up front and it's a long term deal and low interest because dfis generally back these transactions runs into billions of dollars uh there's a saving that saving would generally go into a nature conservation but you should don't you should not jump into it because there's a debt relief you have to be very careful on this 
your your larger purpose should be using this opportunity to protect something or do something on the esg front now there had been debates about should we do nature should we do esg in sri lanka because we are going through a hell you know bit of a not bit a big crisis as we speak our per capita income has come down the poverty levels have elevated to like a 25% plus now so uh what should we do before green is also a question these days should we do green or should we do esg first uh, there is appetite for debt to esg at this point the real challenge for sri lanka is why i think we are struggling because you gone into debt restructuring that's also the opportunity because generally during debt restructuring or soon after debt restructuring uh, you do you can't definitely you can't go to the bond market of course ecuador did long time ago they got a massive rating upgrade uh, it takes time i mean as per the imf program we'll, we'll go to the international bond market in 2027 so until such time the best way to gain you know attract capital would be an instrument like debt to nature because there are dfis who are interested in doing that so from that perspective from a timing perspective there's an opportunity now the challenge is you have done the bilateral you have done the domestic debt optimization you have got official creditors committee's agreement as we speak which is a big positive for sri lanka no you are now trying to come up with a haircut of course the bondholders have given us a proposal which we have you said not good enough uh, we are in the process of now i think going back to the bondholders with with a haircut or a proposal or something like that then should we add debt to nature into this is a question do you have time to do all of that generally debt to nature transaction can take time i get the feeling that uh, it's it's a good deal for sri lanka whether we should do pre or post is the question now we have to definitely do it because government will save hundreds of millions of dollars by going into debt to nature or debt to esg structure uh, opportunity is there uh, banks are lining up uh, i think the dfis are lining up i think we have to grab that because that's the only way of testing the market the investor appetite that will that will be a nice segue uh, to a better fiscal you know uh, strengthening as well because you you pay less interest and then you slowly get more rating upgrades and you go to the international market so even before that maybe you can do a green bond but it'll be a nice start from uh, from that perspective in my view so just to push on that a bit more bingu ban and i want to get chehan's reaction also from someone who talks to the conservation community environment community also but someone who understands finance who is talking to those groups sri lanka hasn't had a very good track record of financial discipline when it came to plain vanilla isps with these new instruments we are expected not just to have financial discipline ie paying the debt off but also the environment discipline around what the funds are going to be used for because these instruments have use of proceeds clauses and so on let's assume we in post restructuring we are now much better behaved and we are financially disciplined the second part the environment discipline the fact that some of the the use of proceeds mean that it has to go into actual project do you see an, uh, you know a gap there where the you, you know that piece is not yet you have built capacity right now if you ask me i don't think we have the full framework in place but these are big multilateral banks like adbs of the world will come into play and they know the country they've been here uh you know i believe uh, those agencies will push uh, uh the governments to do the right thing and they'll be monitoring the international agencies will monitor these uh, conservation efforts i don't think we can take the money and do what we did in the past yeah, uh jian quickly before i move on um just putting your hat on as someone who is you know very literate around finance and financial instruments uh but you're deeply involved with groups like WNPS and others you're you know through your own personal interest but also through these uh, volunteer organizations you you talk to them have you got a sense that they appreciate that there is a role for these forms of new capital whether it's at a sovereign particularly at a sovereign public finance level is there anxiety is there distrust are they welcoming of it do they feel they have a role to play in perhaps ensuring the environmental discipline just give us a a sense of what your um, yeah, impressions a, have been it's a great question and uh quite a tough equation but i'd like to uh kind of react to pingumal uh what he said first and kind of lead that into the second uh, comment which will answer your question our, our macro appetite or 
the journey it'll take to get into this national sovereign level structures. Sri Lanka, if you compare with other countries uh, who are leveraging nature capital, I think there is a certain degree of uh, liberalized, liberalized management of those nature assets. And in Sri Lanka, a lot of our nature assets, formal nature assets are governed by institutions and ordinances that are quite um, mistrusting of the private sector and external finance. And so there is a protectionist um, mindset, which is ingrained over several decades rather than a collaborative mindset. And so how much nature do you actually have to bring into these uh, instruments is the first question I'd ask, because, um, you know, how do you get and you mentioned lack of capacity. So that's what I'm leading to. How do you leverage those nature assets to create a swap? If, if everything else lines up like the governance and the fiscal discipline, all of that, then does the asset have the management capacity to be a party to such an agreement over a long period of time? And I think there is great opportunity for capacity building there. But it's also uphill because you have other countries who, are, who can be great sources of finance. So we are competing against other demanding uh, uh, destinations for this capital who have uh, a greater approach to that. So one quick solution to be very simplistic would be, you know, do we have, can we invest in good PPP frameworks and that kind of capacity building where those entities that do control these nature assets and are tasked with protecting them can come to the table and have this conversation with this portfolio of people it would take to structure something like this from your lawyers to financial backers to the guarantors to your marketing to all of that. But that leads into the second part, which, you know, you're speaking about intermediaries who also have an interest in conservation. And you have an interesting triangle that's forming between them and those with of mixed land use. And when I say mixed land use, say, for example, if you take tea plantations, you have a lot of biodiversity on tea plantations and interesting little ecosystems that don't come under formal land protection of any government conservation agency as such. So you'll have, okay, simplistic leopards on tea estates in forest pockets and, you know, everything from endemic birds down to your, you know, lizards um, in between. So uh, you have little ecosystems that have nature value and you're seeing donors interested on how those pockets of biodiversity can be conserved with private partnership that requires some financing and funding as well. And then entities like WNPS, the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society of Sri Lanka, work with those private sector partners to help create corridors and, you know, create, uh, protect and maybe even expand the ecological value of that mixed land use. But what you're seeing with people like WNPS is also an impetus now, which I think is a great initiative called PLANT, which is to go and find existing pockets of forest um, and start to either uh, buy that land if it's freehold or manage it uh, with the permission of the landholder on a long term. And so when you have what you're getting to then is a uh, informal resource management, ecological resource management um, of areas that fall outside government mandate. And I think that's a very valuable space to grow. And if funding and financing can help entities like WNPS further plant in some form of um, financing mechanism, understanding the return, you may not have a very linear return because not an easiest thing to say, like a, an African conservancy is you, you know, you, you take a bond, you protect that land and you pay it back through tourism earnings. Not all forest areas can predict that level of tourism payback. You know, you talk about a debt for nature swap, then you might uh, amortize that debt over a period of time if you're protecting that nature asset. You can do something similar with intermediaries like this on mixed use land until we get to the capacity building of formal um, government and state managed uh, assets. And I think that's a nice uh, journey and segue to a larger landscape problem or challenge that we have and show proof of success and build, get the small building box going, use small amounts of money to start with, work with intermediaries and mixed land use, and then use that capacity to expand into areas and show success and build on success rather than building on theory. Yeah. Speaking of that, Shahan, when you, some of the projects that you're working on, for example, Pico Trail and others that you may have come across where there are these different parties. There seems to be an interest in moving beyond our traditional donor driven approach, donor funded approach to really go into more sustainable models. But is there a appreciation or recognition for the role of private capital in that? And is there a interest in going down that route or it's still very much, okay, we don't see 
a role for private capital unless it's you know CSR or something. So I guess what I'm asking is, are there conversations going on around how to structure these? You talked about blended finance. Are, there could be other mechanisms. Are you seeing an interest in that, or are we still very much at the early stages where you see what Bingo Mal and Errol talked about? Your kind of quote unquote green loans on one hand, the private sector putting CSR money, you know, philanthropic money to conservation. We don't really see those words crisscrossing. We don't, you're not yet seeing um, different forms of private capital coming. So I guess you alluded to that from the blended financing. I just want to know the readiness levels, willingness levels to I'd like to answer that with the illustrative example of the Peco Trail project, which is basically um, the, the trail is funded by the EU and supported by USAID to a tune of roughly $3 million total project value. And that was, uh, and the faith in this, in the trail as an experience is aligned with, you know, we call it demand driven because uh, post COVID, you had a market, uh, the travel market saw a, a material and measurable shift into more sustainable experiences, into more nature based and nature positive experiences and being out there, being connected with nature, but without destroying it and doing what tourism usually does, which is go to a nice place and, you know, <laughs> clutter it. What, what we have right now is an opportunity where thanks to the risk taken, and I say risk because it's not a typical donor funded project to build capacity or to train um, uh, beneficiaries. The, the project itself, whether the trail will fail or succeed is quite risky. There's a lot of players involved. There's, um, you know, 13 to 15 private companies. You need their unanimous buy-in. There's three to four government agencies from Wildlife and Forest and, you know, Sri Lanka Railways, um, who it's not, you know, this kind of thing is not their bread and butter to evaluate. And so there's quite a bit of risk linked to project success. So you have donors who have taken on some sunk capital to put into this project. But then the reason it's good risk is because it's a market driven experience. So we are creating a product which ties into demand for a product like this globally. And so the trail may be uh, the reason you come to Sri Lanka rather than you come to Sri Lanka and then do the trail. And what that brings is that it aligns the businesses with the market, the audience, the visitor who is looking for uh, a sustainable, lower footprint, more ecological, uh, immersive experience. And so those businesses then align to what the customer wants and they are willing to be measured rather than and, and to be and to you know either be accredited with a sustainability rating or organization uh, because they understand that that's what the customer is seeking. So the alignment is nice. And so capital then can be fluid into meeting uh, that end um, because it's market driven. Uh, which is the result of something rather than trying to change behavior and realign an existing sector to something else. But before I finish, and, and so I think there is a role for all stakeholders, all of us in whatever hats we wear in society, to voice to donors continuously like, look, okay, the next, especially for tourism support, I think there is a curiosity as to how can you support a certain sector and where should that money go? And I think this kind of uh, greening Sri Lanka's tourism would be a nice way to divert some attention and donor support. And not just um, in the traditional way, but in supporting some structured um, instruments and bringing blended finance into this ecosystem. Before I pause, just want to change gears a little bit um, to an article I read, uh, and I think Pingumali were quoted in that article in November uh, last year, which was recently about the size of debt that the tourism industry has, and I think it was about 700 billion was what the article mentioned with uh, a chance to increase to uh, a trillion uh, in the next few years. And so you mentioned uh, we have an opportunity right now with in the sovereign debt issue. And I think there's also an opportunity for to use tourism debt to say, OK, if we can work on some interesting structuring mechanisms with DFIs, with financial institutions and be a bit creative, how can we use that debt uh, to create an instrument that's not, maybe I'm being too optimistic and saying, okay, if it's not at the macro sovereign level, then we can work at the private sector level. Um, but I know all things are layered. Um, but at least then can you work on some level of debt swap or debt relief where if you, if you, the players in the tourism industry start to be more sustainable, 
get accredited with international standards and show your footprint and show reduction, then that debt relief or some level of structuring or, or restructuring for the sector comes into play. So that eases the burden on the local bank's exposure to the sector, but also incentivizes the tourism industry at large to take quite a strong pivot with some financial um, incentive and which is why I said at the start that money can be a great mobilizer for this change. Uh, it's not the end all. Um, yeah. So just to, before we move to our last round being one, I want to get a reaction from you on that. So we talked about, of course, the sovereign level, but we know many sectors, traditional sectors, brown sectors are under debt stress. Moratoriums have now come off. Central Bank has talked about business revival units and so on. Where do you see this nature positivity, natural capital kind of focus and the finance that can flow to it coming into play, as Shahan said, in helping resolve some of the debt distress at an enterprise level, at a sectoral level, because we now talked about the sovereign level. Is that is that possible? Is that there is a possibility? But just to acknowledge, like seven hundred billion debt on thirty percent in in stress now, so that's a significant component. Yeah, yeah, more than two hundred, maybe close to three hundred must be in stress now. That's close to a billion dollars. A sizable book to do something like this, no doubt. Question is who's going to lead this? Because scattered in the banking sector, so the DFIs will have to take. The lead on one hand and then the banks will have to set up a consortium set up like a tourism revival fund linked to nature uh, technically possible uh, yeah we just came up with a potential blended finance yeah. instrument that we can talk technically about. possible um, but to further yeah. that point if you look at the tourism a lot of the collateral uh, a lot of our competitive assets are cultural or natural and so a lot of tourism economy is centered around nature assets, whether it's marine, whether it's terrestrial, national parks, you know, reefs and all of that. And so to go back to the point earlier about, you know, nature assets and how do we un um, or, or de-link or at least liberalize some of this in the private sector, private capital uh, state owned equation. You can ring fence some of these businesses that who are very dependent on the quality and the sustainability of those nature assets, whether it's marine or terrestrial national parks, etc., um, and work on that while you take an overall general approach to the sector. You can still get even more local and look at those and say, look, how can you give back if you are going to do X, Y, and Z, and then there's a funding mechanism to mobilize that. So you indirectly come into a nature asset and natural capital, sustainability and management and restoration through this as an opportunity, just because their dependency is on that. And, and a lot of marine assets and reefs and all have are on quite a slippery slope and you're seeing competing uh, land use wants for aquaculture, for mangroves and even, you know, inland kind of estuaries and you know, those landscapes. You're, you're getting on to a very progressive conversation um, using this opportunity and you know, this is risky situation because, you know, policy will say tourism is going to be one driver to get us out of this right now. But if the fundamentals of the sector uh, have 30% of the debt is distressed or stressed, they're dependent on nature assets. Um, and those nature assets don't have a strong outlook. If you were to give a credit rating to each nature asset in terms of its longevity and sustainability, what would you give that? You know, what would you give Veditalti? What would you give, you know, um, Kumana? What would you give other uh, interesting areas of ecological value? Um, and then say, okay, how do we further that? Because I, I don't think the credit rating for those outlooks are going to be very strong. Um, they'd be probably mid with the potential to really improve, but still not that alarm bell level. Uh, but now we get to change the trajectory. Before we conclude, I want to get uh, a reaction from each of you uh, on, on, a, on a very specific and short um, question. And it's really about looking forward and priorities. So um, maybe Errol, I'll start with you. What would you think is one key priority for action? And particularly when you think about one side we didn't talk enough about the demand side the enterprise side the businesses who are you know you know gain, gaining from the project that you're you're working on around circular economy plastics and so on uh, so if you were to think of one priority area of action relating to the demand side what would that be what key message would you have yeah so uh, you see even if the funds are available with the banks right now there are no projects 
the demand is not there the reason is uh, the as i said you know the uh, community the public doesn't know doesn't know how to create the uh, demand for example now today i read the in the news 31 locations are identified for solar parks now those are the projects that private sector can pick up actually or the banks can get involved and uh, uh, introduce local bonds basically you know 31 entrepreneurs can take up those big banks can come up with domestic uh, you know we are talking of green bonds we can't go to the international market because of the current context but you know in the medium term we need to try out local solutions you know we need to identify projects that we can handle and along with that you know biodiversity there's enough of opportunity because i saw we have over 100 corporates that that have come forward what we don't have is right now projects they are ready to fund they are, you know it's not not for a tangible return right now they get the return is intangible right but we have results to show look here your five years investment is this is so now funding is there but projects are not there so one important thing is to identify these projects you know and create the projects because ultimate goals that we have to reach by 2030 goals that we have to reach by 2050 uh, under the Paris Accord and uh, all this is about that basically green financing so in our project in my project this plastic project that's what we are doing to el eliminate and bring innovation uh, introduce a recycle process reduce and repair and you know all the you know all the new concepts into the industry so that the, the plastic industry will be modernized basically there will be new concept design to meet these targets basically so let's create you know uh, let there be capacity building in this respect you know creating projects creating projects because it's very easy to always say no resources no money no money but the money will come if the projects are there and if they are marketed to the public you know that's what we have experienced and that's what we have uh, uh, right now uh, uh, evidence in the market uh, Bingamal, I'm going to put you on the spot. I could have asked you what's the message you could give your colleagues in the banking sector, but that would be too easy. So I'm going to ask you if you had to give a message around priority action, one priority action for uh, policymakers, regulators, government, uh, to, in the spirit of accelerating finance towards a more nature positive economy, what would your priority action be? Yeah, I mean, as we all know, Sri Lanka is vulnerable for climate risk. Uh, and we have to think big. We sometimes try to find few things to just tick the box and say we did it. Uh, I think for me, power is the biggest opportunity that I see in Sri Lanka and, and be part of the Asia's energy transition. Uh, MANA alone, that basin alone got like a 40 to 50 gigawatts opportunity. Sri Lanka as a whole, now the, re the recent reports are saying we have a 90 gigawatts opportunity around Sri Lanka. So 50 gigawatts fixed uh, as well as floating wind power, but you have to export. Maximum we'll use seven gigs, maybe 10 in time to come. Uh, what do we do with the rest? We have to export. So we, it's uh, the grid connectivity from Sri Lanka to India, uh, undersea, you know, subsea cable, and then, you know, the grid enhancement on our side to, you know, uh, connect uh, is something that I'm looking at policymakers making the, because uh, it's current CB policy or the electricity act wouldn't support this. You need a separate bill for this. You need a separate committee for this. You need to action it really fast because world is moving really fast. As we speak, uh, UK, Denmark, UK is, I think getting power from Denmark, you know, if I'm not mistaken, Viking link is 760 kilometers long under sea cable. Darwin, Australia is building something with Singapore to export power to Singapore, 5,000 kilometers long. So world is moving really fast and these undersea cables are now becoming cheap and cheaper. So if we don't move fast, India will find their power from somewhere else. So I would urge the policymakers to come up with a framework really fast because there are investors knocking on our doors as we speak. Can we set up and export power? I know a couple of them actually, at least two big ones and they have the appetite multi billion dollar investment opportunity if you export 40 gigawatts just do the numbers it'll be bigger than any export in sri lanka at this point okay strong message on a potential specific sector in that uh, in the energy transition um shehan my question to you is around so this energy i guess is more on the mitigation side we often talk about natural capital by nature enhancing biodiversity enhancing conservation enhancing side side of things so if you had to give a priority message it could be even something we talked about today you want to re-highlight or, or a new message 
on what those other stakeholders, maybe not the financial institutions, but other stakeholders, what would that priority action be to not just focus on mitigation, not just focus on not doing harm, but actually nature gain, find fund financing or finding capital for projects and initiatives that you know improve on and build on our natural capital? I believe uh, the most sustainable solutions would be something that's market driven. And I think there is a market, uh, whether you're in agriculture, whether you're in tourism, whether you're in energy, where there's demand for greener solutions, products and services. And I think for us to, at a policy level, if you can support access to those markets, then the market drives everything through the value chain where um, you can access green financing. If you want to lower your finance cost, you can get supported through facilities that are available to you all the way down to then that becomes a catalyst to work with the capacity building for anyone who is managing natural capital. Um, talk about managing natural capital without what success looks like in mind can be not the optimal use of resources. And it's not about even catalyzing because the demand is there, whether it's, you know, for, for all sorts of things. Even for aquaculture, you still have certain regulations in the West where, you know, the, the, the more sustainable um, something is, the more preference it gets in accessing that market. So, I think if you take a demand-driven approach and align your value chain accordingly, then other things align. Uh, but it's a two-step process. Uh, that without the capacity building for natural asset management and resource management, um, you know, would have a, a fracture in the equation. But I think you need those two. And it's not that those two don't have to be linear, but those two do complement each other to get to what I would say you need some small successes to start. While thinking big is needed to get us where we are going, I think small successes would excite um, other levels and pools of capital um, to access returns that uh, are green, but not at the expense of um, a return profile investor is seeking. So I think those, if that triangulates well, which is hard, but I think we are up against a bit of a slippery slope. So we have to, <laughs> uh, yeah, think big, as you said, and go hard. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen, Shahan Ramanayaka, Erola Bharatna, and Bingu Malthiva Tantri. Thank you very much for your, your thoughts. I think, folks, we covered a lot of different aspects of it because I feel that in Sri Lanka, now we've ha we, we tend to have very simplistic understandings of what the potential for green finance or for uh, new sources of funding for natural capital enhancing, nature positive economic activities. And hopefully this session brought a bit more nuance because of what the, the panelists brought to the table and helps people think about, you know, it's it's not it's not easy, the opportunity is there, but we do have to put in some work, whether it's on the demand side, whether it's on the uh, regulatory policymaker side, whether it's on coming up with new, new models, thinking of new ways of allowing for natural resource management. So these pieces have to come in together and um, there's a lot for us to, to work on. I hope you join the rest of our series in this Nature Positive Economy, uh, partnership uh, we have between the Center for a Smart Future and Echelon. And thank you very much to all of you for taking the time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.